we shall behold him face to face. I don't know, that, have we ever sung that as a congregational before? Have we? Must have been one of those many times I stayed home. <laughs> it's a good one for the message tonight. We're going to talk about the rapture of the saints. So, I'm just glad to be here. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians and be finding that. find myself, as you know, taking my glasses off a lot. You may wonder why I do that. It's just something I do to keep you attentive. Actually, because I can't, I can't see up close without them. I mean, I can't, when I, I can't see up close looking through my glasses. I had my glasses changed. So I lay them down or take them down a lot. So I, I lose them a lot. Because so, some days I'll go nearly all day and I won't have them, right? So right before church, I couldn't find them tonight. I looked and looked. I had my wife looking and looking. So she had an idea. She said, let me call you on the phone. That's what we do when we lose our phone. Let me call you on the phone. I said, that won't help me find my glasses. <laughs> We have so much fun together, don't we? So if I lose my glasses, just call me, right? <laughs> Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's stand together, please, if you're able to, and let's read some scripture together. Verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren... Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica. I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of, an archangel, of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So we're going to begin here as we think about the rapture of the saints, the rapture of believers, and something we've heard about, thought about, heard preaching about, I have for more than 40 years now. And um, we're going to look at it and look at this context a lot. There's a lot of information in this context, in this particular passage. We'll also look at many other passages tonight. We're talking about, by the way, for those of you who maybe guess tonight or hadn't been here for a couple of weeks, we're just covering some uh, topics on Sunday nights for a few weeks related to end times, eschatology, the end of the end, end times or last days. And so this is, this is the next big event, and it's already scheduled. The good news, I'm going to tell you tonight when it's going to happen. No, I'm not going to tell you tonight. Uh, but... We'll learn some things about it. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for your word. And God, we pray tonight that you would help us to learn, teach us, open our eyes, help us to behold wondrous things out of thy law, and help us to know what we believe and why we believe it. And God, we thank you that you're coming for us. Just that very thought is comforting to us. So please bless as we study that subject tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We should say in the beginning that the, the word 
rapture, that word is not in our English Bible. It's, not in the, it's actually based on a, a Latin word that means to be caught up or to, to catch away. But this word, uh, if you look in our, in our t- text tonight, we talks about that he's going to come for us and um, that we're going to be taken up to be with him then uh, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about the rapture, that uh, he's, he is going, the Lord himself shall descend, and verse 17 says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. And that's, that's the event that we're talking about when we're being caught up. The word that's translated there is harpezo, and it means to cease, to snatch, uh, to pluck. As a matter of fact, I like words. Let's look at a couple of places that very word is used. And we're coming, we'll keep coming back to 1 Thessalonians 4. But go to Matthew for a moment. Just a couple of examples. This is the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13 and verse uh, 18. Matthew 13, 18. Uh, Jesus said, Hear you therefore the parable of the sower. Then verse 19, it says, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his earth that in his heart that word those word that phrase catches away is the same word is translated as caught up it means to snatch to take away uh, go with me if you would please to the book of acts this is a neat example of it acts chapter 8 and uh, this is the end of the record of philip and his time with the ethiopian person there the eunuch and how he this person got saved and baptized. In Acts chapter 8, it says that after he was baptized in verse 39, if you look there, Acts 8, 39, and when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord, and here it is, called away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. Just God took him away. And that's the word, same word that's translated in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17 when he says caught up. That's what's going to happen. Now that's what's going to happen. One of these days, when God determines the time is right, he's just going to take us away. Now, you say, I don't don't know how that's going to happen. Well, God's going to do it. The same way he made everything out of nothing, right? If he can do that, he can surely get us out of this world. And so that describes what we call the rapture. It's going to happen. We don't know when it's going to happen. In this text, verse 15 Uh, Paul is specifically talking about the coming of the Lord. Look there. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, those of us who are alive at that time and remain, unto the coming of the Lord. So this is the coming of the Lord. The next time he comes, he won't be coming as a babe in a manger. He's going to be coming as our Savior and Redeemer, and he's going to take us out of here. All saved people will be caught up together. Now we're going to dig into this, chapter 4 here, because there's a distinction between those who are living at the time that Jesus comes for us and those who've already passed away, they're already gone to the Lord. And and the Bible is so clear, so special in the way it it just details all of this. We're going to be caught up. It's the promise that Jesus made to his Troubled disciples, I'm going to read it to you again. You know it well in John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus said to his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. He's going to come and get us. Amen? I'll say this again later, but Paul believed it was going to happen during his lifetime. It's very clear. I believe it's going to happen during our lifetime, right? I believe it's going to happen. When we were singing about that tonight, I thought, what a perfect moment. What a perfect opportunity. But that wasn't the right time, but I thought it had been a good one. We call it the rapture of believers or the rapture of saints. Now, some people call it the rapture of the church. I don't call it the rapture of the church because there are saints, there are believers, there are saved people who are not in the church. But all true believers, whether they're in the church or not, are going to be caught up. So I call it the rapture of the saints. 
or the rapture of believers. Now, the, the purpose, let's stay here in 1 Thessalonians for a little bit. The purpose of this, the general purpose Paul is writing is to explain to the church members about the state of saints who've departed this life. That's why he said in verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. We shouldn't be ignorant about such an important matter. Um, the, the word sleep or asleep, you see it there in verse 13, concerning them which are asleep. And uh, then verse 14 it says, Even though them also which sleep in Jesus, makes me sleepy, just start reading about it. Verse 15, it says that we shall not prevent them which are asleep, three times there. And that asleep obviously talks about those who've departed this life. Uh, Jesus used that phrase, and I'm going to look at it if you join me in John chapter 11, when, when uh, the, the sisters of uh, Lazarus had sent for Jesus to come and be there because Lazarus was sick. Uh, Jesus has a conversation with his disciples in John chapter 11, and he uses this word, these words. John 11 and 11. These things said he, and after that, after that he saith unto them, he says to his disciples, John eleven eleven. Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. In other words, let him sleep. If he's sleeping, let him sleep. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So we understand what he means in the Bible often when they talk about them that sleep. He's talking about those who've departed this life. We would say those who've passed away, those who are no longer with us. And, that was, and that's what the Thessalonican believers were apparently curious about. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. I don't want you to be ignorant about where your loved ones are who've gone before you. Um, and by the way, there's nothing in this passage or anywhere else in the Bible about soul sleep. You know, that's, what's, that's what I believe Seventh-day Adventists, that's what they believe. They believe that when you die, you lay in that grave, and your soul is with your body in that grave, and you're there until the resurrection. That they're ignorant about what the Bible says. Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant. Their bodies are in the grave, but that's not where their spirit or soul is. It's not there. They're, they're with the Lord. Matter of fact, look in the text, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So when Jesus comes back, those whose bodies are in the grave, he's going to bring those people with him. Very clear, isn't it? Where, if they're going to be with him, bring them with him, where are they? They're with him, right? That's, that's what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, where it talks about those that are, this, these people who are asleep, they, their bodies are in the grave, but they, but they themselves have gone to be with the Lord. When Jesus comes back, they're going to accompany him. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6, if you're taking notes, you could, it's, it talks about to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. As soon as you and I leave this life, then our spirit soul goes immediately to be with the Lord, right? That's what, Jesus, that's what we remember about the gospel of Luke when Jesus talked about the rich man and Lazarus. And um, when Lazarus died, the angels came and carried him to Abraham's bosom. The rich man died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. There's no other, there's no other thing from the Bible to understand about the destination of our eternal spirit or soul. If we're saved, we go to be with the Lord. Look in uh, Philippians uh, chapter 1, if you would please. Philippians chapter 1, Paul talking about how he is perplexed really about the about the two 
options, not options really, I don't think, but the fact that he could choose to be here or he could go to be with the Lord. Philippians chapter 1 um, and verse 21, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I wot not. For I am in a strait, S-T-R-A-I-T, betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So he said, if I'm here, here I can be a help and a blessing. It's needful for you. But if I, if I leave this life, I'm going to go to be with the Lord. I'm going to depart. And so, that's, so, there's, so where are these people? Go back to our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. They're with the Lord. Now there's a distinction made in this passage, I said earlier, between those who are alive at the coming of the Lord and those who are asleep. Or though when Jesus comes back, the saints are one of two places. They're either on this planet, still alive and breathing like us, or they've already gone to be with the Lord. And so let's look at this in verse 15. For this we say unto you, and I love this language, by the word of the Lord. This is not my opinion. Paul says this is God's word. The word of the Lord has showed me this, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. That's us right now here. We're alive, we remain to the coming of the Lord. Shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now that word prevent um, gives people trouble, a little bit of trouble. It's an old English word. And we think of preventing something as keeping it from happening. But in the day the Bible was given to us, in the King James, the word prevent had another meaning. And that, and that meaning is to go before or proceed. If you have a trouble remembering that, you ought to circle that word prevent in your Bible and right beside it write precede. So what does that mean? It means we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. In other words, we're not, if Jesus came back tonight, we're not going to go first. We're not going to our we're not going to precede those people who are asleep. They're going to go first and there's numerous other places we can look at where it talks about that. So this so at the coming of the Lord, those who are alive on this earth, I'm assuming we're all going to be alive when he comes because I'm expecting him to come by the end of the service. So Assuming that we're all alive and well during the service when he comes, we're not going to go first before those that are asleep. So if you're asleep when he comes, you get to go first, right? <laughs> so look at, look at verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. He's not sending an angel. He's not sending an entourage. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And who's going up first? And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So at the coming of the Lord, we're all here alive. We're not going to prevent those or we're not going to go before those that have already died and they're asleep. They're going, to, they're going to immediately go. The dead in Christ, keep this in mind, verse 16, shall rise first. So the dead in Christ, the, the spirit soul of the people who are dead, they've gone to be with the Lord. Their spirit's in heaven. Their body is in a in a grave somewhere or decomposed but they're not in the, they're in heaven but they're not in a bodily state but when the Lord comes back their bodies are going to raise and go to be with the Lord resurrected in a new state and will be reunited with their eternal spirit this is all going to happen faster than you can bat an eye isn't that a wonderful to think about you talking about amazing stuff this is amazing stuff <laughs> Mark your place in 1 Thessalonians 4. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, that great chapter that deals so much with the subject of the resurrection. And I want to read a few verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verse 35, Paul asked this sort of a rhetorical question. Some man will say, how are the dead raised up? 
And with what body do they come? If the dead are going to be raised, what kind of body are they going to have? And it, there, there's so much in this chapter that we won't take the time to look at tonight, but you might go back to that and just kind of refresh your memory at another time. But let's skip down to verse 50 because that's what I want to get to. Verse 50, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, this is the body that we have, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. This body is not made, is not equipped, is not fit uh, to live in heaven. Verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. When the Bible used the word mystery, it's not talking about something mysterious. It's talking about something that was hidden in the past, but now it's made known. It's a mystery. I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He's talking about our body. We're not all going to die. Some people are going to be alive when the Lord comes back. But notice the language, the last part of verse 51. We shall all be changed. Whether we whether they're people who've died and their bodies are in the grave, they're asleep, they're in heaven, or those of us who are alive on the earth, we shall all be changed, verse 52, in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, that's what he said to the church in Thessalonica, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. When the trumpet sounds, he comes back, these dead bodies will be raised incorruptible. Regardless of how decomposed they are. Regardless of where they are. Have you ever thought about this? People, maybe they had their ashes thrown out in the Atlantic Ocean. How's that going to happen? I'm telling you, God's going to bring all that substance back together. Except it's not going to be the same kind of body that we have. Right? That needs glasses and can't find them when you have them. It's going to be a different body. It's going to be, an, it says it will be raised incorruptible. Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. What is immortality means it's, it's not capable of dying. Immortality, you have the inability to die. We're all going to be changed. And given these brand new bodies. It's wonderful. So when this corruptible, verse 54, shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, isn't that victory? That's victory, isn't it? I mean, in every sense of the word. By the way, that, that will be the consummation, the completion of salvation. When you, get, when you were born again, when I was born again, we were saved, our spirit was raised from the dead and is, is an eternal spirit. It's never going to die. But we have a soul also, mind, emotions, and will. And the process of sanctification is thus being changed all the time. We're thinking differently. We're, we're choosing, making choices. God's working in our life. We're becoming more and more Christ-like. But this body, this body is not being saved right now. It's, it's the older you get, the more you'll understand that uh, it has its limitations, it's getting frailer, it's getting weaker, it's just making me tired thinking about it. But, the, but, but when we're saved, this body will be saved. I mean, we're, when he takes us out of here, we're going to have brand new bodies. Hallelujah. It's going to be wonderful, isn't it? That's, that's the consummation, the completion of our salvation. So when, so when Jesus comes back and he the first thing that's going to happen is that those who are asleep, those who are with the Lord, their bodies are going to immediately come out of those graves. Now, I know some people talk and sing, make songs about how, you know, the clods are going to fly when you come up out of the grave. I don't think that's going to happen because that's, we don't have a body. We, the new body we get, you can walk through walls. Jesus did, right? 
this brand new body we're going to get, it's not going to have those limitations. So, so you're not going to be able to look at the cemetery and say, well, it happened. They're all, look at all those empty graves. No, they're just going to come out of there. And they're going, to meet the, they're, they're going to meet the Lord in the air. They're going to be united with their spirit and soul, and they're going to be in the air. And those, we will not go before. They're going to go first. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with the Lord in the air. It's all going to happen, the Bible says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's not even batting an eye. That's like a twinkle in someone's eyes, like a flash of light. That's how fast this is all going to happen. And you're sitting there thinking, I just don't know how that's going to happen. What's well, going to happen just that fast? Amen? It's great to think about. And back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17, it says, So shall we ever be with the Lord. We'll never ever again be without the Lord. Now, these, these truths, as Paul writes here, and I'm back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, these truths are a source of great comfort. Um, that's why he says in verse 13, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Not having this hope would cause added sorrow and grief when you lose a loved one. You know, and the, many people in this room, not all of us, but many of us, have said goodbye to loved ones that we know were saved. You know, I have. And it's comforting to know. You know, you've heard me say this before, but I. I can remember when I got the call um, one afternoon, I think it was about 3 o'clock or so, that my mother had gone to be with the Lord. My office, this building wasn't here. In my office, one of a number of offices I had, my office was in the room over there um, where now the equipment is at. It's part of that room where all the sports equipment is. And uh, I got the call, and whoever answered the phone said, uh, you have a phone call? I picked it up, and my sister-in-law, Donna, said, Tom, uh, she's gone. That's all she said. I'll never forget. Tom, she's gone. And my first thought was, she's with the Lord. She's with the Lord. That's comforting to know that, isn't it? Doesn't mean that we don't have sadness. It doesn't mean that we're not... Um, we don't miss them, but I'll tell you, this is a comforting reality. Matter of fact, uh, Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, he called this the blessed hope that we have. The blessed hope that this is not all there is. So that's how it's going to happen in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, I want to talk a little bit tonight about the timing of the rapture because there's more than one school of thought, more than one opinion about the sequence of these events. The rapture, the great tri tribulation. And the time of great tribulation, that'll be, our, that'll be in a couple of weeks we'll cover that. I'm not, uh, the great tribulation period will last seven years. I believe that's clearly taught in the Bible. Seven years. And there's much in the Bible about it. Old Testament, New Testament, the epistles, and the book of Revelation, of course. Now, I believe, and many people believe, that the rapture will occur before the tribulation begins. That, and that will be the signal. That will be the undeniable signal that we're on the calendar for the end times. We've been, as I said last week, the end times started during the gospel era. But... Um, the moment we leave, I believe seven years will take place before Jesus comes back to this earth. But there are those who believe that, that the, the rapture is going to take place in the middle of the tribulation. Because in the middle of the tribulation, there's going to be three and a half years of um, a false peace and, and the Antichrist is going to come into power. But in the middle of the tribulation, that three and a half year period... The uh, Antichrist is going to sit up on the throne of, uh, in Israel and he's going to rule. 
and it'll be the abomination of desolation the Bible talks about. We'll talk about that at another time. But some people believe that's when the rapture is going to take place, that we're going to go through the first three and a half years. That's sometimes called the mid-trib, mid-tribulation. The, tribulation, the rapture will take place in the middle of tribulation. Some people actually believe the rapture will take place at the end of the tribulation, that we'll go through all seven years of the tribulation and then we'll all be taken out. I'm convinced it'll occur before the beginning of the great tribulation. Part of what I'm going to be talking about tonight is just my reasoning, my thinking that answers some of the questions about that. And I'm not, you know, this is not something that if a person believed differently, I'd say they're not saved. I'm just going to say, I think the scriptural evidence to me is overwhelming that the rapture will take place before the tribulation begins. We've got a little graphic. It's not really that clear, but uh, we'll, we'll show it because we like pictures, right? That's a beautiful picture. Is it up there? Oh, okay, it's not on the back wall. Okay, so it's, it's, the, it's the little letters. You can't hardly read some of it, but, but Christ's second coming is the general subject. Over to the far left is Christ's first coming when he came to this earth, born of a virgin, uh, died on the cross, and then 2,000 years or so where we are now, called in this graphic the times of the Gentiles, and then you see the rapture. This is what I believe will happen and when I believe it will happen. Whenever it happens, the rapture will happen. That's the next event. Then there's a period of tribulation of seven years. And it's going to be more horrible than any of us could imagine. And then Jesus coming back. Notice in the rapture, the arrow coming down and up. Jesus coming down, we're going up. In the return of Christ, we're coming down with him. And we'll, talk, we'll briefly look at that tonight, but we'll talk about that more at another time. Then, after he comes down, when he comes back, there'll be the Battle of Armageddon, some things that we're aware of. Then we'll have a thousand-year reign of Christ on this earth. And so that's, that generally, in a graphic form, says what I believe. Are you with me? Okay, so we're going to talk about the timing of it a little bit. Let's go to a few passages I just want you to notice some references just in 1 Thessalonians first. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we're not done in chapter 4, but, um, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. This was very much on Paul's mind, of course, as he's writing and the Spirit of God is leading him as he's writing. In chapter 1 it says... Um, talking about the grace of God in the Thessalonican believers... In, in verse 9, for instance, how they turned to God from idols, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, to serve the living and true God, verse 10, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. So they're, you know, this, they're, just, they're anticipating the coming of the Lord. Chapter 2 uh, verse 19 it says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? There again talking about really what we would call the imminent return of Christ. Chapter 3 and verse uh, 13, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all his saints, when he comes, with his saints. We already, of course, spoke of chapter 4 and verse 14 about he's coming. And then chapter 5, I want to read in chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 5. But, but of the times and the season, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. I'm talking about the time of judgment. This is the day of the Lord, the time of great darkness. Verse 4, but you brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day, and we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, 
putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Notice this. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. I, these verses make it clear to me that we're not going to experience the wrath of God in the tribulation. You know, think about this. If the rapture were to happen in the middle of the tribulation, then the Lord's return would never be imminent for us. In other words, we know the timing of the tribulation. We know once it starts in three and a half years, it's going to intensify. We know in three and a half years, the abomination of desolation will happen in, the, in Jerusalem. So where is the imminent return? Like he could come at any moment. If, you, if that were the case, the imminent return would not even be a biblical reality. I'm giving you some reasons I believe that the rapture will take place prior to the uh, tribulation. Uh, go with me if you would to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And here Peter is writing about um, how God judges the wicked. And verse 4 he says, If God spared not the angels that sinned, he cast them down to hell. God judges the wicked. First Peter chapter, second, did I say first? It's second Peter. Second Peter, good. Second Peter chapter two and verse five. And spared not the old world. Second Peter chapter two, verse five. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now what, were he, what Peter's giving us and what we already know from the, our study of the Bible that this was God's pattern in more than one time and that is he removed the righteous before he extended judgment. In Noah's day, in Noah's day he got Noah and his family safely on board the ark before the judgment was poured out on the world. And look in verse 6 there of 2 Peter 2. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. So here again, it's the pattern. Before God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, he got Lot, who was righteous, out of that city before his wrath was poured out upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says in verse 9, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. I mean, to me, that's, again, we're just, we're just comparing spiritual things with spiritual things, but it just seems to me to be very clear that God is going to take us out of here before he sends judgment upon this earth. Now, but, now just let me clarify something. That does not mean that we're not going to experience things leading up to the great tribulation. We will. According to Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, um, the, we're not, the, the end is not going to come until the Antichrist is revealed, but he could already... The Antichrist could already be alive and well on planet Earth. For all we know, we just don't know who he is. And we may, we're gonna, we, may, we may be watching as the one world confederation is coming together that will become, you know, this, uh, the, the, the great beast and the, the, all these things that we'll talk about in future lessons. But these things could be going on right now, Right? It's not like it's going to be everything's going to be one way and then all of a sudden it's like turning on a water spigot. Then all of a sudden the great uh, the God pours out his wrath. We could be experiencing things leading up to it. That's why I believe Jesus said in Matthew 24, it's like uh, these are the beginning of sorrows. They're going to just continue to happen and more, more intense. So that doesn't mean we're, when I say we're going to be taken out before the great tribulation, it doesn't mean we're not going to experience some tribulation. People are experiencing tribulation all around the world, even today. 
One thing that people don't sometimes think about when you think about the coming of Christ is there are two distinct comings, and it's almost like you could say it's two phases of his coming. The, the rapture, when he comes to get us in the air, and then when he comes to this earth to, to, for the battle of Armageddon and the things that transpire uh, at his second coming. So theoret- really, you could call it, really, when you talk about the second coming, you're talking about Christ coming to this earth. But both these things are seen in, in the scripture. Both of, them are, both of them are seen in our text. And I'm not going to read these again. But I believe in the chapter 4, the end of chapter 4, we have the rapture. And in chapter 5 and following, we have the second coming and the great tribulation and the wrath of God poured out. And, uh, you know, if you, look at, if you look at these two events, they're so different. And I know some people believe that, you know, they're all the same, but they're not. For instance, at the, at the, at the rapture, Jesus comes in the air for his saints. In the second coming, Jesus comes with his saints and comes uh, to this earth. Zechariah says that when he comes, he will put his foot on the, of the Mount of Olives. That's the second coming. When he comes in the rapture, he's not going to come to this earth. We're going to meet him in the air, right? So you're talking about two different distinct events. One, he's coming in the clouds, takes us in the air. The other, he's planting his feet on this earth, and it's going to be amazing. Uh, at the rapture, only... The believers will see the Lord. Let's go to let's go to um, 1 John chapter 3. Uh, 1 John chapter 3. We sang about this earlier tonight. We shall behold him. That's nice. First <laughs> John chapter 3. Verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When he comes, we're going to see him. We're going to, everybody's not going to see him. We're going to see him. Now, you know, we speculate a lot about these things and kind of imagine. But just, you think about what it's going to be like when Jesus comes and takes us out of here. And we meet him in the air. Every, any scenario you think about, you can imagine what it might be like. If you're driving down the road in your car and all of a sudden you leave and unless you got one of these cars that drives by itself it's going to be a problem right you're sitting in church and all of a sudden everybody that's saved just disappears think about that what that would be like how they're going to explain that it's obvious it was a ufo took them all away these <laughs> that's what's going to happen and we're going to disappear we're, and we're going to see him, but the whole world is not going to see him at that time. But at the second coming, the Bible says, you're in First John, go to the right just a little bit. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. Every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So at the second coming, when he comes back to this earth, everybody's going to see him. Matthew chapter 24 in that great um, passage, that chapter devoted to answering the questions, what it'll be like when he comes back. Jesus referred to that. I'm going to read a couple of verses. It says, um, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. This is explained in Revelation chapter 6. And the stars which fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of the Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. 
and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's not how he's going to come at the rapture. When he comes at the rapture, he'll take us up. We'll see him. We're all going to go to heaven. When he comes at the second coming, everyone will see him. I'm talking about there's great differences between these two comings. At the rapture, the saved are delivered from wrath. And although the world will experience wrath during the great tribulation, at the end of the great tribulation when Jesus comes, he's going to pour out his wrath on the world. And I was just reading about that today in the book of, a book of Jude. Differences. There's no, there are no signs that have to happen for the rapture. In other words, there, I don't know of anything biblically that has to happen before we can be taken out of here. But before the second coming, when he comes back to the earth, a lot of things are going to happen. The Bible tells us things that are going to happen in our world and in, in government and all kinds of things. We'll talk about that later. So these two events, in, in my view, these two events are separated, the rapture and the second coming, by seven years, called the tribulation period. The rapture could happen at any time. I know I've said that, but I say it again. It could happen at any time. I'm going back to, I want to go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and emphasize something if you join me there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And look in verse 15. Paul says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive. I had that we circled in my Bible. We. You know why? Because Paul felt like he would be in that. Paul says, this we, we which are alive and remain are the coming of the Lord. Paul felt like it could happen at any time. Look in verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him. We. Those, he, Paul thought he, it would be him. He thought he'd be in it. And he was wrong, but he was not wrong to expect him to come any time. It just wasn't going to happen in his lifetime. But I'm, I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not making this up, folks. If Paul lived with the anticipation that he would be taken up in the rapture, it, it could happen at any moment, it stands to reason that we ought to live with that same expectation. Amen? He could come at any moment. Paul, uh, the Lord would have us be mindful of this. This is the next big event. We don't know exactly when it's going to happen. We don't even know, we can't even guesstimate when it's going to happen. Paul wrote this to Titus, looking for that blessed hope, looking, looking for it to happen, expecting it to happen, anticip looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians, he said, waiting for the coming of, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus. Waiting on Jesus to come. Waiting means we're expecting. And Philippians 3 he says we look for the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking. Now I'm saying this to help us and encourage us. But I'm telling you there are a lot of people I know that don't look for him to come. They don't normally look for him to come. You know when you, when you got company coming you look out the window every once in a while. To see if they're coming Right? People are coming to visit you. Families coming from out of town. You're wondering when they're going to get here. Good thing in our family, nobody's ever late. But sometimes families have people that are running late. And why are y'all laughing? <laughs> they're looking. But the, and Paul was looking. And he told the Corinthians to be looking. And he told the church at Philippi to be looking. And he told, talked to Titus about looking. And yet we go through days and weeks and months sometimes and we don't even think about it. We ought to be looking for him to come. He could come in this service. I think this would be a great service for him to come in. I'd have to interrupt this series, but that's okay. James says, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. We believe, it's, we believe that we're on the very doorstep, the threshold of his coming. So we ought to be looking for it. Now what happens, we'll talk about this next, what happens after the rapture? We're going to go to heaven, those of us who are saved. What are we going to do in heaven? 
Two things are going to happen during that seven years that we know of. One of them is the judgment seat of Christ. Believers will be judged according to their works. A the second thing that's going to happen is the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's going to happen during that period of time, I believe. What's going to be happening on the earth? A time of great unrest, great anarchy, the appearance of the Antichrist, the great tribulation will begin. Now let me end by just giving you a couple of things that will not be new to most of you, but maybe we need to be reminded. And, and that's how important this matter of the imminent return of Christ is to the way we live our lives. Uh, we were in 1 John a moment, just a moment ago. Maybe you're still there. Let's go back. Let's go in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. In verse 28. And now little children abide in him. That when he shall appear. We may have confidence. And not be ashamed before him. At his coming. I don't want to be ashamed when he comes. Right? And he warns us we don't want to be ashamed. Ashamed of what? Ashamed of the way we're living our life, ashamed of maybe what we're doing, ashamed of what we're not doing, ashamed of what we should be doing. You know, the second coming, I think, is one of the most, the, the imminent return of Christ, looking for him to come, could be one of the most motivating factors that we could have in our life. It, should, it motivates us to holy living and purity. Why would we... Why would we be doing certain things if we know the Lord would come back? It motivates us to faithfulness and service. I really believe if we knew the Lord was coming back at a particular time, we might all of a sudden find times to do things that right now we can't seem to work into our schedule. Because when we see Him, we want to be faithfully serving Him, doing what we ought to be doing. It certainly would motivate us to evangelism and missions if we knew he could come at any time. Steve might remember this. I don't know if he was around at that time, but uh, many, many years ago, we were in the other building. Uh, we came up with this idea. We called it the last 48 hours. And this is what we did. Starting on a, sun, a Friday night, we, we challenged the church with this idea. Think about this. We challenged the church. What would you do if you knew you only had 48 hours till Jesus came back? We, we had a clock, and we started on a, Sunday eve, a sat Friday evening, and we ended it at church on Sunday night. What would you do? Spend the next 48 hours just like you would live if you knew Jesus would come back. It was pretty interesting. We started, some of us started with a prayer meeting over there when the, I think it was about six o'clock at night. That's when we started it. Then we went out evangelizing in the town and can't ever find sinners in St. Clair, of course, but we got, we'd evangelize. We stayed up all night, one night, just witnessing and praying. You know why? Because if you knew, some of you, no, I don't mean this to be critical, but you can't even wrap your mind around this. But if you knew that Jesus was coming in two days, you'd live differently tomorrow and the next day than you normally live. Is that right or wrong? An honest person would say, sure, that's right. I've got loved ones. I'd get on the phone and call them. I'd say one, more, one last time, are you sure you're going to heaven? Neighbors, people we haven't witnessed to. If we really believe Jesus could come, I'm just telling you, this, is a, this could be a real motivating factor for all of us. Because the reality is the rapture could take place at any moment. And the moment it happens, everything changes. Drastic changes take place. We're going to leave if we're saved, those of us who are saved. But it begins seven years like nothing this world has ever seen. Tribulation. 
pain, suffering, the mark of the beast, horrible realities. And the good news is, for those of us who are saved, we're out of here. But the bad news is, those who are not saved have a rough road ahead of them. So this matter of the rapture, I think it's a pretty important doctrine. And I'm glad we took the time tonight just to talk about it. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, you're gambling with your eternal soul. That's what you're doing. You're counting on the fact that maybe down the road somewhere, maybe after I've done some things I want to do, I'm going to get saved. But I'm going to tell you, and I'll, and I'll cover this again in this series, but I'm fully persuaded that anyone who has rejected opportunities to be saved in this life will have no opportunity to be saved during the Great Tribulation. There will be people saved during the Great Tribulation, but it won't be people who've heard and rejected the gospel. You're gambling with your soul. And I'm not trying to make you afraid, but I'm trying to get you to think. You ever think about what it'd be like sitting in a church service and all of a sudden there's only four, five, or eight, seven, or eight, whatever, one or two people left? What if you're the only one left? And a lot of people in the world may not know what happened, but you'll know what happened. That's pretty serious stuff. Amen? So if I were you and I'm not sure, I'd make sure. I'd get it straight. And those of us who are saved, it ought to be a reminder. Let's, let's live like he could come at any moment because he could. Let's bow our heads together for prayer. Our Father, we come before you tonight thanking you for your word and, and all the different details that we find in your word that help us to better understand. We know there's so many things we don't understand. There's so many things that we're not sure of, but these things tonight we're confident about. We thank you for that. We only know it because it's in your word and because you show it to us through your word. Father, you know our inclination it is to not to think about things that are important sometimes but help us help this reality to be a part of our process our thinking process father help us to live with eternity in mind lord we want to tell you once again we thank you that you're coming for us that one day you'll come for us We'll meet you in the air, along with all those who've gone before, who you'll bring with you. We're thankful for that. Father.